Hey everybody, just want to welcome you to Module 1, Lecture 2 for ME 171 Design of Elements course. So I just wanted to go back to the design project for a little bit and go over a couple different things that are related to um, what type of projects will be acceptable for your design project this semester. So any device that's related to a rehabilitation science or assistive technologies is going to be eligible for this project. Now, I know this is a pretty broad uh, topic here. There's a lot of different types of devices that could be included within this. Um, basically, anything that any type of device that's going to help people perform activities that were otherwise difficult for them is something that will be acceptable for this project. I'm eliminating this criteria here about the disabilities. Anything that's going to help you perform activities that are otherwise difficult will be eligible for this project. So this is something that uh, different types of things that may be included. Um, it can still be an aid for people who have disabilities. It can be something if somebody has an injury and they're helping to recover from the injury. Um, it also could be something to do with physical, to enhance physical, anything sports related, athlete related, or it could have something to do with uh, mental capabilities of healthy individuals as well. So anything that's going to, again, help perform activities that are otherwise difficult. So as far as these activities, what I mean by that, this could range over a large topic of things, anything from daily living activities or to higher function applications, again, for athletes, for like sports or leisure even as well. But the main thing that I want you guys to focus on is the mechanical design of these devices and not just the electronics and programming side of it. So this course is gonna be based upon the mechanical side. Everything we're learning and going through is gonna be the mechanical side of this. So I want you to focus your design on the mechanical side of this rather than the electrical. So down here, I and I list couple of good options down here. And this isn't a list you have to pick a topic from, but I'm hoping you might see something in here and it'll start to spark your interest and like, oh, I have an idea that's somewhat related to that. And you can pitch that as your idea for the project. So with your project, I've lifted out some important goals here and your project does need to identify at least one of these. So the first one being, it's a very significantly novel design, not something that already exists, not common to an existing device. Or two, it's similar to a existing device, but you found a way to make it significantly lower cost, more available, things of that nature. Or third, it's similar to an existing design or device, but add some improvement to it. Could be to the device aesthetics, uh, sustainability profile, safety, environments, functionality, any of those things. So now let's get into some of our basic definitions from the first chapter of our text here. Let's talk about design itself. So as a verb, design is to plan out the particulars of a component. As a noun, this is a process of creating the particulars of a component. Second definition of a noun, it's the end result of the process, your final design. So analysis versus design. Analysis, if only one answer exists. Design, if more than one solution exists. And deciding on the suitable path requires being creative, making choices, providing or performing various tests, um, and evaluating. So reproduction. This is the exact copying of an existing design, but with some very small modifications. Let's talk a little bit about what is design. So on a larger scale, things that can be designed here is you can design a product, you can design a device, a machine, an apparatus, an assembly can be designed, an entire system can be designed, or even the process can be designed. Now this is all talking on a larger scale. Now on a smaller scale, we can design parts that might be part of a larger scale product of design. And these small scale things that we can design are an individual element, a component of a system, component of a product, a part, or even a sub-assembly. So this is gonna be important as you're thinking about your project here of, okay, what on a large scale is the entire thing that I'm designing? And what are the smaller scale components, elements and parts, sub-assemblies that all go into my larger scale final design? So within the design process, one of the things that's important to consider is your types of manufacturers. So a type one manufacturer, this develops a design, the design requirements for its products, which includes the assemblies, some assemblies, 
components and materials that are going to be used to fabricate the components and form the end process structures. Now for type two, this, uh, these designs a, it manufactures a component uh, or sub-assemblies for customers based on design requirements developed by the customers. So if the customer themselves develops these requirements, this manufacturer is going to design um, and, and manufacture the components based upon what the customer has told them. Whereas comparison to a type one, this rate, the type one type of manufacturer develops all the design requirements for its products and everything, kind of does everything all in one without as much input from the actual customer. Now type three, this right here, um, type of manufacturer manufactures products based on designs um, developed by its client companies. So the entire design and all the specifications are developed by the actual customer or the client company given to the manufacturer and they just do exactly what those specifications state. So within product development, there's going to be different types based upon what you're doing. So let's take a look at those. So an incremental improvement would be a, something that's a minor change to its features or correct some flaws or deficiencies that you may have found. Uh, derivatives change the look and the feel, but not the function. New product platform. So new family of products on a common uh, platform, uh, of familiar markets and product categories. Now we're talking about fundamentally new products rather than just the product platform. Fundamentally new product is going to be a radically different product or production uh, technology, um, and it's going to be new and unfamiliar market. So for a forward problem, we're given the machine configuration, the dimensions of our parts and the materials, and we need to determine the performance and reliability going back to some of the statics and dynamics calculations and problems that we've seen before in uh, past courses. And we need to make sure that it doesn't fail. So that's where we're going to use our mechanics of solids and materials engineering courses to relate these here. So this is how we're going to incorporate some of the courses that you've taken previously um, within your curriculum at UVM. Now, in contrast, we could talk about an inverse problem. So now our given is going to be the desired performance or reliability, and we need to determine all the stuff that was a given in a forward problem. We need to determine the machine configuration, the parts dimensions, and the materials in order to achieve this desired performance and reliability. So we need to convince why this is best, and minimally, it shouldn't fail. So now here, if we're talking about element design, we may have a list of specifications. This is a list of specific, non-arbitrary needs, uh, the final acceptance list for the project. So if we go from there, and if you have some obvious solutions here, we can go down to embodiment here. So you have one complete set of concepts and embodiment that may contain final details and can satisfy all of these specifications. Now, if there are alternatives or no clear solutions, we come down here, we may have some different concept ideas here. These are ideas to achieve the specifications that may include some embodiments and details and should include some alternatives as well. So within product design, we have several different phases. So we can start here at phase zero. We have our planning phase. Uh, phase one, concept development. Phase two, system design, system level design. Phase three will be the detail design. Phase four, we start doing some testing and refinement. And phase five, we ramp up for production. Now, we're talking about design here, so we're going to focus right now on the actual design component of this and look at the different phases and how it relates to design. So in phase zero, the planning phase of our design, we consider product platform and architecture and assess new technologies. And that's all in our planning phase of this here. We move on to our concept development. This is where we start to investigate the feasibility of project uh, product concepts, develop industrial design concepts, build and test some initial prototypes. This is where we actually start getting a little bit of hands-on experience here within the concept development and try to implement some of those concepts into a prototype. Now in phase two, this is a system level design. This is where we generate alternative product architectures, define some major subsystems and the interfaces between them, and refine the industrial design. 
From there, we move on to our detail design in phase three. This is where we define the part geometry, start getting into all those type of specifications, choosing what materials we're going to use, doing all the research and understanding which ones are going to be best for our project, uh, assigning tolerances, uh, complete industrial design control documentation of everything. So that's all within phase three when we start getting into the details of design. And in phase four, we start doing some testing and refinement. So we do some reliability testing. Life cycle testing is very important. Uh, performance testing, obtain any regulatory approvals that you may need for it, and implement any design changes for things that you've seen that need to be modified or updated along the way. Once you've performed all of those, you're happy with your life cycle testings, your reliability testings, you've met all the regulatory requirements, uh, you then can move on to production and ramping up, and you evaluate the early production output. So this is a brief overview just related to design as we're going through from the initial planning all the way up through production phase of a project design. So a lot of what we're going to do, we're going to focus in on uh, phase one, two, and three, your concept development, system level design, and detailed design. So we'll talk a little bit how these relate to some of the other courses you've taken, some you may take in the future, and how it will relate to this course as well. So if we focus in on those three phases, phase one, two, and three, we talk about phase one here, the concept development here, where we investigate feasibility of product concepts, develop industrial design components, and build and test experimental prototypes. Well, for building and testing experimental prototypes, within this course, a lot of this may be done within SOLIDWORKS and doing some FEA for the testing. If this leads on to future courses, this may be something that you can do for your seed project, where you actually physically build and test out these devices and prototypes there. For phase two, we're talking about generating alternative product architectures, defining the subsystems and interfaces, um, and refining the industrial design. So this can relate back to some of the things you may have done in your ME111 Systems Dynamics course. We just incorporate some of those within our, uh, in this case here, our detailed design in phase three. Moving on to phase four, we're defining our part geometry, choosing materials, assigning tolerances, and completing the industrial design and control documentation. This right here is a lot of stuff that, again, you can do within your SOLIDWORKS modeling there for some of these different parts, uh, especially as related to your project, your design group project for this course. So this leads us into talking about the design cycle, and let's concentrate here on phases uh, zero through four within this here. So if we're talking about the design cycle here, <clears throat> first thing we want to do is define the overall objectives. So once we have all these objectives in front of us, we kind of have an idea of what we're doing for the design here, we need to choose a strategy. So from the strategy we choose, we can then gather all the required information that we're going to need. From there, make a first cut at the design. So this might be some brainstorming sessions, a list of different options, uh, different types of designs you may be thinking about in the back of your head, but make a nice little list of them and take a first cut at the design, how you're gonna design it. From there, once you have that idea, for one of those right there, we can build a physical prototype. So this, if we're talking about in our class here, maybe a prototype that you're building uh, within a solid modeling uh, program such as SOLIDWORKS, uh, outside of this class, a physical prototype could be something as rudimentary as a little wooden design, something like that, where you're just getting the proof of concept, getting your hands on it. Uh, from there, document. This is something that I cannot stress enough, documentation all along the entire process. Whether you immediately start building the prototype and say, wow, this is really not something that's going to work or I don't want to do it, document that. Knowing what doesn't work and why it doesn't work can be just as important as throughout this entire design process. So once you've documented everything, you then run a certain testing on this. This may be some type of tensile test, life cycle test, anything like that, functionality test. From there, you get your results. Does it meet the actual specifications? And if yes, then go ahead and test the final product. Most times we're gonna to need to go back here and say, no, it doesn't, so there we're going to go back and revise it. When we revise it, we go back, make sure, you know, maybe be tweaking some tweaks to the prototype there, and then make sure we document, test again, and repeat that, and keep staying in that inner loop there until we get something that does work for us for the uh, final finished product. So when we're discussing design objectives and functions, some things we want to define here are the performance, take a look at the reliability, the shape, the size, the mass, the style, all those things are very important within those design objectives. 
costs in manufacturing are huge as well. So once you know, okay, it needs to meet these performance and reliability standards or requirement specifications. I know it needs to be less than this size or weight or fit inside something else. I know it needs to have this basic shape because it needs to interact with something else. All those things, it needs to have this type of style uh, are gonna be important, especially when we get down to the cost and man costs in manufacturing. You know, maybe lightweight, all of a sudden drives the cost really up and you have certain cost requirements you need to stay within. Or maybe it takes, you know, you're using stainless steel and it takes different types of manufacturing processes. So all those are important to define within your design objections and the function because they're gonna be important for all the other stages within the design process. So quantifying the achievement of the objectives with metrics and functions uh, uh, with requirements. This is very, very important. So if you're gonna quantify the achievement of your objectives with the metrics, you can go back to them, relate to them, see what worked, what didn't work. Uh, the functions with requirements relates back to everything we talked about with performance, reliability, the shape, the size, all that right there, whatever your requirements are, does it still function correctly meeting all these different requirements? Now going back to our actual design cycle here, gathering information. A lot of this information may come from talking with the customer, the person who's hired you to do this. What are their needs? What are their wants? What are their desired outputs for uh, the, the design of whatever product you're making for them? Uh, you're gathering information related to competitive market. What already exists out there? What prices are they charging? How readily available is it? Gathering information on what parts you're going to have to need to make and manufacture yourself or existing off the shelf parts you may be able to purchase. Uh, other things to consider within the design cycle, safety requirements sustainability, what are the related industrial standards, are there any government regulations that are going to dictate uh, certain things within the design process and functionality and functions of it, um, any intellectual properties that you have or that you have gathered from the information that the customer has given you. So let's go back to here to our design cycle itself, take a look through. So again, we're going to build, document, and test. So right here, build, document and test right down here. From there, we're gonna revise and revise again. So we're staying in that loop there. What worked, what didn't work, what tweaks can we make? So this is gonna be part of the process. Again, you spend a lot of time in this loop here. It's very rare that you all of a sudden, you you know go through the first stage of this here. You have that design criteria, you've gathered information, you did your first cut, built a prototype, tested it and it worked. That's a very, very rare case. You're gonna build a rough prototype, document like crazy, test like crazy and keep revising and revising and going through that there. And as you get back past revising and it doesn't work still, you know, you may be some big changes you need to make to the prototype there before you go back in and test it again. So with that in mind, this kind of leads us into this design paradox. So come down here and take a look at this curve here. So we can see with the amount of time you have into this design process here, you start right here at the very initial part here, and the more time you put into the design process, the more knowledge you're going to gain about the design problem itself. Now, inverse to that, you start at the beginning and you may have a lot of design freedom. Again, as we come up with our brainstorming, all these different conceptual ideas, well, the more time you spend in the design process there, the more you realize those freedoms are limited by regulations and things like that as you go on. In order to fit all the criteria and specifications, your design freedoms kind of decrease the more time you put in design and the more knowledge you gain about the design problem. So this is our design paradox there. Now, something else to consider as we're talking about the amount of time that we have into the design process here is our risks to success and our resources required. So the more time we spend into it, a lot of times the risk of success decreases substantially as we continue on and put more and more time into this. This is for many reasons. One reason that's pretty obvious to me is that the more time you put into it is the more resources you're spending. And a lot of these projects, especially in real life situations where you're designing it for a company, you have a budget. And if you're spending so much time into this right here, you're spending a lot more time and eating into that budget. And also, time into this, we're talking about prototypes, revision, testing. There's gonna be a lot of resources required. So the more time you spend into it, the more resources are gonna be required. So with that increased number of resources, you can cost more money, eat into the budget you may have, and decrease your risk of success. So what are some of the requirements for a, success, a successful product? Well, 
one requirement is that the product has the performance and reliability to satisfy the needs and wants of its intended customers. So this is the biggest thing to determine is it successful is did you meet everything that the uh, uh, customer or the client had required of you for this product? Another requirement here is that the cost to develop them and manufacture the product stay within that budget, whether it's the budget of a grant, research project, the amount of customers willing to pay for it, or maybe something that you're designing for yourself and you've already established the budget for, okay, if I spend this much time into it and I still need to make a profit and I have this amount after I've done my record research that I can sell it for, once you've exceeded that budget, you know, you really don't uh, have a successful product if it's going to cost you more to produce than you can sell it for. And lastly, a requirement would be that the product is released to market or the customer on time. To the customer on time is very important. They've paid you to do it. They have their reasoning. They want to get it out for yourself. This may be something that's time crucial. If you don't get this new product, this new innovative idea out there quickly, there's going to be a lot of more competitors that hit the market before you and there's not as big of a market by the time you actually release your product. So we'll talk a little bit about the business perspective of this, and this is something that is important to consider. Even though we're engineers, we need to understand the business side of things as we're developing these products and designing these products. So return on investment is something that's going to be very important for your client and for yourself if you're making something uh, within your own business or within a research project or grant. And to get this return on investment, it's going to have a couple of different requirements here. One of the main requirements is going to be sele uh, selecting opportunities that best suit your organization's ability. And th this is important. I know as engineers, we don't ever want to say, that's not something I'm capable of. But that's something that we need to have the ability to do is to look at it, analyze the opportunity and say, this is something that I have the resources, the time, the money, the skill set, and I can do this is in a good match for my company, my group, our, our, our uh, engineering team. This is something that we can accomplish. And if it's not, this is something that you don't want to get in over your head on and commit to something that you're not don't have the capabilities to complete. Um, another requirement is meeting the product development schedules. So that's something to take a look at. Are these reasonable? The client may say, okay, I need this entire thing designed into market in nine months. And if you really take a look and break that down, you're like, well, just the initial design concept and the prototype development is going to take us a year. Then that's something you need to negotiate or determine that that's not a good match for you as well. Meeting the target cost. So again, that's something that's important in the beginning. Discuss that with your client. Take a look at your budgets and decide, okay, is this something that's attainable? With all the testing, paying the engineers, the design product, the materials that they're requiring, requiring can I meet these target costs? Um, and last here for the requirement here, generating products that have good customer acceptance and market share. So this is a little bit tricky. You may have a lot of people come to you with what they think is a fantastic idea, the next million dollar uh, product that's going to blow up the market, and you need to make sure that uh, you, your team, or your client have realistic expectations of that when you're generating products and that they do have good customer acceptance and market share. And it is something that is marketable that you can get out there and there is a need for. So that's why you know, that phase zero to phase one where you're doing your market research and a little bit of background history, is this something that is going to be good for that? So these are all things to consider if you want a good return on the investment. You don't want to put all your time, energy, and resources into something that you really can't sell. There is no real market for. Other considerations we've touched on briefly here. Safety. Did you design this in a way that is safe? Did you meet all the requirements by OSHA? Uh, any government regulations that may be associated with this? Is it something that's sustainable? And uh, what are the societal impacts of this product? So those are other considerations we'll get into in a little bit more detail later on. So if we're talking about societal, engineers should make designs that benefit humanity. So this is something to really think about when you're when you are working on a project, a new concept idea, working with a client or your team, your company. Um, there is a code of ethics. Uh, ASME does have this out there. It's called the Fundamental Principles and using their knowledge and skills for the enhancement of human welfare. So this is what we're talking about by benefiting humanity here, that we're using your skills, your knowledge, and to enhance human welfare. So continuing on the societal, what are the benefits? What are they related to? So here we can see that we uh, can relate these to survival, security, social acceptance, status, and even some self-fulfillment. 
So continuing on with societal, we want to talk a little bit about the assess factors in a life quality index. So one of these, some of these assess factors, well, your physical health. Then we can also talk about the material well-being as well. Your safety is definitely going to be a factor. Uh, ecological factors, uh, cultural, educational, inclusion of disadvantaged populations, uh, equality of the opportunity is a factor, uh, and insurance of personal freedom as well are all societal uh, fall under the societal category here for your assets factor, assess factors to the life quality index. So now what I want to do is talk about an actual physical example of a product and a project design um, that we went through all the process for. So this is something here that was developed all the way from initial concept design and taken to market, uh, the, the Segway human transporter. The idea behind this was this will be to the car what the car was to the horse and the buggy. So we all see now in the future from when this was initially designed of how this came out and really wasn't what the car was to the horse and buggy with the Segway. It kind of came, was a fad for a little bit and then pretty much disappeared. You might see able to rent one of these on a boardwalk, but that's about the extent of how it still exists in society today. So let's take a look at the design about this and talk, discuss some of these different topics that we've covered earlier in the lecture. So we can see there's a lot that goes in. From an engineering standpoint, this is an absolutely amazing product here. Uh, all the different components here, the different specifications, the different materials, how it balances, the electronic de development and programming of it, all the gearing and chassis, the wheels, everything. There's a, quite a lot of engineering that goes into this product. So continuing on with that, let's talk a little bit about the life quality index and societal benefits as related to the Segway. So we'll start here with the top, our physical health. So this device does make you get outdoors. You're not riding in buses, taking trains. You're not stuck in a traffic jam. You're getting some fresh air, maybe using a little bit of core strength to help you balance. So there may be some physical health benefits related to uh, as compared to some of the other alternatives for transportation now as compared to riding your bicycle or walking or something like that maybe not quite as much but there are some arguable physical health benefits uh, that can contribute to the the life quality index there now material well-being now defined in terms of satisfaction satisfaction with a range of economic concerns costs necessities household income things like that well this is not necessarily readily available to everybody in the public. It's a very expensive uh, uh, product that not everybody has the household income or the need for um, really doesn't uh, work well for people that live in a climate where it snows majority of the year. So in the Northeast, we might not be able to utilize this or you're in an area with uh, not paved roads. You're not in a city atmosphere. You're on dirt roads. You know, maybe this is not something that's... Uh, Going to really be a cost effective necessity uh, or something that you could afford uh, safety we'll get into a little bit more of the safety of this we've all seen a lot of different uh, fail videos i'm sure of these you know there's a lot of technology a lot of electronics involved here a lot of things can go wrong um, the control mechanisms are not the easiest to use so there are some safety concerns with this uh, ecological concerns well it does have some ecological benefits related to the life quality index here uh, low to zero emissions, uh, smaller footprint, less traffic jams, all those things could be beneficial. Cultural educational uh, doesn't really necessarily apply for this one here. Not too many that I can see there. Uh, inclusion of disadvantaged populations. Well, economically disadvantaged, no, it doesn't include that. Um, uh, as far as um, inclusion of people who maybe are a little bit larger or um, disabilities you know this might not be a product that, that everybody could utilize and take advantage of um a, uh, a quality of opportunity again back to where you geographically live your economic situation eh, there's not really an equality of opportunity for one of these for everybody um ensure personal freedom i could see that yeah use a little bit more personal freedom be able to move around a little bit better again as compared to being stuck in a traffic jam things of like that and Go on the sidewalk with these. So we can see these are all questions that we need to ask ourselves for the societal impacts related to the product. So even before you take this to market, especially before you take this to market, maybe you should be going down through with your initial concept design and asking yourself all of these. 
you know, because this is going to be important for uh, the actual sales and marketing of, of the product at the end. And is it going to be successful or not? You know, so if you ask yourself these societal questions, even though as engineers, we may think, well, you know, that doesn't really apply. Well, really it does, because these are all things that need to be addressed in your design and even in your initial concept before taking it through the whole design process and taking it to market. So now let's jump in to talk a little bit about safety. And one of the main things is just awareness in general as related to the safety of your product and the design. So this is gonna be very important. Only the engineers can affect the safety of the design. So as you're setting it up, you're coming up with these initial concepts, you're designing this, even from the preliminary stages, safety needs to be in the back of your mind or actually probably in the front of your mind uh, as you're thinking about the individual components and how you're gonna design this product. Um, Things that are also going to be important to really consider is the legal side of things here. Legislators, attorneys, judges, juries, insurance, all those things, um, uh, they may affect after the fact, but you need to really start considering these at the very beginning and how you're going to address these um, different concerns related to safety. Um, <clears throat> other thing is of a relative nature, who is the user? What is the acceptable risk? And this is an important thing, important concept here of what is acceptable, acceptable risk. Um, <clears throat> what is the result of, accept, of accepting this risk? And how do we evaluate multiple risks? So we can think of a couple different products where people have an acceptable risk. Let's just go to the skateboard here. Well, yeah, it's a very dangerous product here. You could hurt yourself in many different ways and how you choose to use it. There's more risks uh, that are associated with, with the different types of use, but it is an acceptable risk. It's a pretty commonly acceptable pr uh, product. People usually aren't getting sued for producing faulty skateboards or for people getting injured on their skateboard that they've designed and built and put to market. So these are kind of um, the acceptable risks associated with that. People know that, the user knows that, um, and they're willing to accept those. Um, what is the result of accepting risk? So you do still take the chance as the designer, manufacturer, owner, producer, whatever it is of the skateboard of somebody deciding, oh, wow, this bearing froze up. It caused me to stop, fall, break my wrist, something like that. Or the truck broke on it or the actual deck snapped in half. So these are all things that you could be liable for. So what is the result of second success? Well, there could be lawsuits. So we go back up here to things, thinking about legislators, attorneys, juries, judges, going to court, all these type of things. So insurance is another thing here. Make sure you could have a good uh, general liability policy when you're producing a uh, product that uh, could have some acceptable risk associated with it. How, how do we evaluate uh, multiple risks. Oh, there's many different ways that we can evaluate the risks. But again, one of the main things I want to focus on right now is just thinking about what these risks are from the beginning and how we evaluate those is maybe we change something. We, so let's go back to the skateboard again. We don't want the deck to break instantly when a 200 pound person stands on it in between the trucks in the center. So maybe we do a little bit of three point bending analysis, a little bit of FEA and SolidWorks, and we try a couple different materials, a couple different types of wood and layers, plywood, maple versus pine versus balsa. So maybe we do that and we decide, wow, we can't, a balsa wood skateboard would be great from the weight perspective, super light. But all of a sudden somebody, even a hundred pounds stands on it and instantly snaps. When we did that initial three point bending test, even in an FBA, um, and we decide, okay, that's, that's a risk that we don't want to do. We want to rechange uh, the material that we're going to utilize for the deck. So with that discussion, it leads into what I want to talk about next, which is anticipation as related to safety. We need to imagine every possible hazard we can. So general rule of thumb that's good to follow, anything that can happen will happen. So you may design a product and you think, okay, if they use it based upon its intended use and function, it's going to be great. It's going to be bulletproof. They're not going to be able to break it. Well, people aren't going to use things as intended. Let's just think of a chair, for example. You know, it's meant to sit, distribute your weight in a certain manner, only meant for one person. Well, there's many times two people may sit on a chair or you may stand on the chair in order to reach something up higher and using it as a ladder outside of its intended purpose. So you're sitting on a chair, maybe you don't have to worry about uh, frictional forces and it not moving and sliding on certain floors. But all of a sudden somebody stands on it and pushes off on it, all of a sudden that becomes a factor they could fall and hurt themselves and then it's a safety hazard there. Or you've designed it to hold up to 300 pounds, you have your safety factor factored in for one person sitting, all of a sudden two people sit on it. 
and all of a sudden there again is another safety hazard associated with that. So we need to do this anticipation for things outside of what we anticipate as the normal use of the product. So another quote here to think about is a common mistake that people make when trying to design something that's completely foolproof is to underestimate the ingenuity of the complete fools. And even uh, as not to go as harsh as this is calling everybody complete fools here, many times we'll use something again outside of its intended use. And it may be foolish to use something outside of its intended use, but it's something that is going to happen, something that we need to anticipate as engineers and designers. Um, respect the user. Uh, also, those involved in the manufacturing, assembly, shipping, installation, maintenance, uh, removal, and uh, recycling of the product here. So think about all of these things when you're designing a product. So you may not even think about that, like, okay, here's my final product. I've thought about all the, anticipated all the possible hazards for use of it here, but have I thought about how it's gonna be manufactured and the safety of the manufacturing of this type of product? Maybe I don't wanna use plutonium in this here. Um, you know, with shipping installation, you know, how big is it? How heavy is it? Did I design it in a way that it can be broken down and then reassembled? What is the maintenance schedule like on this? You know, do I need to make sure that in order to stay safe, they need to oil this component every three months? Have I included that in a safety manual and packaging as I go out? When they dispose of it, what are the safety factors with that? Is it biodegradable? Things of like that. So there's a lot that goes in to safety and anticipation of safety factor that we might not think of right out of the gate when we're doing our initial concept design and brainstorming sessions. And this is something that we want to continue out through the entire design process. Include these safety considerations as we're going through the entire design process. Don't just add these on at the end, like, okay, I've designed it. How do I make it safe? No, you need to start thinking about this from the very beginning with all these safety considerations. Uh, perform life cycle analysis of safety. So life cycle analysis is very important. So again, go back to just the simple chair thing, you know, sit up, stand down, sit up, stand down. Let's just say, even with a safety factor, we put 300 pounds on it. So somebody sitting up, standing up, standing up, how many times a day do they do that? How many days a week do they do that? How long are they seated for at an average time? So this is something that maybe in an FEA or maybe a actual material testing system is set up where you put a chair in a tensile testing machine, you load it with 300 pounds for an hour, unload it, load it with 300 pounds for an hour, unload it, and do this for the life cycle of it. So let's just say that we find that on average, people are going to stand up and sit down on their chair 50 times in a given day, five days a week, and the average weight is gonna be, let's just say we go with that 300 pounds again, and for average sitting time is 20 minutes at a time. So do we, we need to figure out a life cycle test and perform this analysis to determine how long this chair is gonna last based upon the average user using it, with those weights, those cycling loads. Uh, you know, we may find out we have to say, okay, this chair is only designed for a three year use or five year use, whatever it ends up being. Um, <clears throat> Continue on in order to minimize the level of risk if failure occurs. So let's just say, okay, we're gonna anticipate all those things we talked about anticipating and somebody's gonna use this, all of a sudden two people are gonna sit on it and all of a sudden we get to 500 pounds instead of our 300 pounds that we've tested everything at. What can we do to minimize the level of risk if this chair goes and falls out? Well, maybe we make sure that there's no sharp objects and nothing's gonna break and it fails in a manner that is as safe as can be possible. This is what we're going to call a fail-safe design. A lot of times we've heard this more with electronics, but this applies just as much with our mechanical things as well. And again, going back to that chair example there and how it designed to fail out. Maybe the legs are at a slight angle. So when it fails, they're pushing out and away, and they're going to slowly collapse to the ground. It's not going to be a catastrophic failure. Maybe there's little braces that we put in or a little cushion at the bottom. So when it does fail and fall down, it absorbs some of it. So all those things are things to think about. Again, just a simple chair design, but incorporate that into some bigger designs, more complicated designs for this fail safe that we need, to, we'd like to incorporate just in case it does fail. Now, if we're talking about safety, we need to also talk about utilizing these government and industry standards. OSHA, ANSI, ASTM, FDA, EPA, all of these have some very, very strict regimented standards. So when I think of an OSHA standard, um, I was asked to design a product, an automatic potato slicer for a local company. And this is something I had to consider, you know, they're using the manual ones, they stick a potato in it, then they pull a lever. 
Well, even with that one there, manually, you could leave your hand inside holding the potato and all of a sudden come down with the cutting blades and cut your hand. Now, if they want that one, a pneumatic one that's automated, all of a sudden, I really got to start looking at some of these standards. I don't want to get sued. If somebody decides, I'm going to hold my hand in there, depress uh, a foot pedal to engage the pneumatics, and all of a sudden chop their hand right off. So this is something I need to look at OSHA and a lot of these OSHA requirements for something like this requires the safety shield and a complete hands-off operation requiring two hands. So for something like this, they'd need to place the potato in there, close the safety shield. There'd be a little switch in the bottom that wouldn't allow it to operate until that safety shield was in place. Then they'd have a button on the left side and a button on the right side far enough away that there's no possible way either of my hands could be near the cutting blade. So with all those safety factors there, I need to implement all of those into my design to meet OSHA requirements. So then it comes back down to, is this cost effective? Does the customer even want this? Does this save any time at this point? Put into the manual and boom, boom, boom. Yes, there's issues of soreness and injury due to manually pulling it every time. But all of a sudden, if this product went from, you know, a couple hundred dollar quick pneumatic design to meeting all these OSHA requirements and industry standards, all of a sudden it's a thousand dollar product and rather than taking you know 10 seconds to load a potato or five seconds to load a potato and cut it manually it's taking 30 seconds now to load it close the safety shield make sure it's engaged put both hands there disengage open the safety shield load the next potato you're actually taking more time so is it something that's going to be useful so these safety considerations from the, even this example here really do play into your entire design. So that's why I say you really need to think about these from the beginning and just not an afterthought at the end for your products. Providing warnings is also something that's very important and finding the correct wording, the right legal wording you need to include with these warnings is very important. Instruction manuals, any training, maybe even including links to training videos and how to use, maintenance, when it needs to be ma maintained, how to maintain it, monitoring it. Um, implementing of quality control. Quality control is going to be a huge thing. You want all of these to be exactly the same. So you want the quality control along the manufacturing process to be perfect for your specific product. Um, this is also going to be important, important post manufacturing as well. Packaging, shipping, all of those things. You don't want the product to arrive damaged. So did you package it correctly in the right type of material so that it arrives undamaged for the user and ready to use? So going back to our segue, um, safety concerns related to that, things we don't consider. You know, we had a cameraman here deciding to film uh, uh, on a segue, ended up taking out one of the athletes. So other safety concerns to people around you for the use of your product, not just the person on it, are also other things that we want to consider. So now moving on to uh, ecological considerations within the design process here, what we can see is what we have here is a uh, industrial life cycle right here for products. So we can see we have our raw materials that we use to produce the products, it goes into production. From there, it goes into distribution, use, reaches the end of its life and becomes waste. So these are all different things that we need to consider along the way when we're talking about the ecological impact of the rubber product we're designing. So we're talking about design here, design for durability and reliability, adaptable design, for repairability, it's going to make it last longer and not become waste. Reef manufacturability and reusability. Can individual components within this be reused and not be put into a landfill? Uh, obsolescence uh, right here, recyclable and disposable with minimal impact. So which components, if they aren't able to be reused or remanufactured, can they be recycled? Is it made out of material that can be recycled? Is it biodegradable? Um, is it disposable with minimal impact? You know. How is it going to affect the earth if it is sent to a landfill? What are the effects from there? So those are all things to consider, especially from the beginning as we're choosing the materials that we're designing it out of and the production process. Both of those right there, even in distribution, talk about distribution, you've got your packaging materials and stuff like that, and that stuff's going to be thrown away right away when the user gets the product. Those are immediately going to become waste. So can they be recycled? Are they biodegradable? Things like that are going to become important within this process. So as we talk about the ecological impacts here, we really want to think about this natural uh, biological life cycle here, where the types of materials we choose are important, you know, non-renewable resources versus renewable resources. So in, in any cases we can, we should really try to choose these renewable resources. So we come down here and we think about um, 
Are they toxic, organic, inorganic? We really want to try to go with those organic materials that are non-toxic so that we can go back in. There'll be some natural decay. It goes right back to the earth. So we have this biological, natural life cycle occurring there just based upon the type of resources and materials we choose to use within our products. So this is something that is a concern and something within our design process that we really do want to consider is this ecological impact right from the beginning of our design process. You know, it may be a little bit more cost. So these are things that are going to be factored in with the rest of our budget and the rest of our design criteria, but something that is important that we want to consider is the type of resources, toxics, inorganic materials, and this whole natural life cycle, and how that is going to tie in with the other life cycle, our post, our industrial life cycle, our product life cycle over here that we talked about. We take those materials, hopefully it is a renewable resource, non-toxic organic material that we can utilize, go into production, choose those production uh, processes that don't produce any toxic outputs. They don't, um, anything that is waste from there isn't organic material that has a natural decay and can go back in to the earth without an issue. The distribution, what we choose for packaging, can it be biodegradable packaging that we utilize there? Anything that is going to be used that isn't you know, necessarily uh, biodegradable or um, a natural organic material, can it be reused? Let's design it so it can be remanufactured, rebuilt, repurposed from there. So all of these things are important. These two natural and product life cycles or biological and industrial life cycles tie in together with each other. And we need to think about how they work together. So that being said, our product life cycle does influence our environmental life cycle. So what's coming in? We need to ask ourselves what's coming into it. What are the materials? What's the energy requirements? So that's another thing that we haven't really considered too much here is how is it powered? Is it hydropowered? Is it solar powered? Is it wind powered? All those things are important as well with the ecological uh, process here and how this these two life cycles tie into each other. What's going out? What's being waste? What's being produced out? Is it a factory where there's going to be smoke stacks and coming out or is it just going to be steam that's released? Things like that are something to consider all of your waste materials, water, gases, things like that. How does that affect the environment? What's going to be left behind afterwards? What are your scraps? What is your waste? What are the sources of these materials? What waste, what's left behind as far as the energy goes? All those type of things, you know, is it a diesel engine? Is it a gasoline engine? Or is it something that's clean burning? All those things are going to be important. Um, Make sure you determine what's reusable, what's not reusable, what's recyclable, what's not recyclable components there. Because the things that are not recyclable and are not reusable are going to be things that are left behind and end up in a landfill. Maybe try to choose those so that they're biodegradable, things like that. Or try to minimize these number of things so that things can be reused and recycled. Who's affected? So you got to think of, you know, not just the user, but also the, the manufacturer, the other people in society, all those things of who's actually going to be affected by this. So go, continuing on with the ecological concerns here, there are some standards that we can follow. There's some various ASTM standards, so some ISO standards that we can reference as well. This is something we really want to consider this LCA or the life cycle assessment as well. Um, so these are all things I would recommend looking into when we're doing your regulations as far as even like OSHA and FDA and stuff like that. Take a look at some of these other standards related to the ecological effects of the design process as well. Now, relating back to Segway again, this is something that they did consider and how they pushed their product there. And they did some of this uh, analysis. So an example here, if we're able to replace 10% of the 900 million three-mile car trips within eco-friendly Segway, there would be this many fewer, 62 mil million fewer gallons of gas consumed and 286 million fewer pounds of CO2 emitted every day. So this is great. The, the ecological benefits of this are fantastic. And this is something to also consider, um, even though we're talking about design and engineering, a lot of times we need funding, we need backers, we need investors, and we need a business plan. So things like this um, are very important to understand how to write what makes your product stand out, makes it better, makes it better for the, whether it's a better performance, cheaper, more reliable, better ecological impacts like that. This is something that's important to be able to present these quick. You know, even if we only replace 10%, we're going to do millions less gallons and millions less pounds of CO2. You know, things like that are what they want to see. A lot of these pitches that you're going to make to investors to get grants, all this, are going to want these type of statistics. So this is, you know, outside of it being the segue thing, something to consider is quick, good statistics like this are very important. So I have a flowchart here talking about the design 
uh, process here for a design project here. This is something to consider, especially with the design project for this course, to take a look at this even prior to really jumping into any of your ideas. We can see we broke this down into the conceptual design portion on the top and the embodiment design on the bottom here, where you define the problem. What problem are you addressing with the product that you're designing? What is your problem statement? From there, once you have that kind of down, you have the def problem defined, what you start gathering information. Go to the internet, take a look at existing patents. Does somebody already have a patent on this? What other existing uh, uh, products out there are on market already? Uh, all those type of things. You might want to reference some journal articles, trade journals, talk to consultants, things like that. All different great places to gather information related to the project and the product you're designing. Uh, concept generation brainstorming methods. You sit down with your group, whether it's in person, on teams, whatever it is, come up with these different ideas, a whole list of different things, some systematic design methods, functional models. But these brainstorming sessions are very important and you guys can all bounce ideas off each other in a positive manner for some of this concept generation. Now, once you have this big long list of them and you guys have all put this together and done this brainstorming session, you want to evaluate some of these concepts. Maybe eliminate some right away, do some decision make, making, take and do some comparison charts, benefits of one versus the other, all those type of things, put them into decision matrix, go through and kind of narrow those down and evaluate the ones and come out with a better list. From there, you can get into some of the product uh, architecture and arrangement of the physical elements. From that, we talk about now getting into our configuration design, which is going to be our preliminary selection of materials, what type of manufacturing process, and those two kind of play off each other. The type of materials you choose are going to dictate the manufacturing processes that are available for those types of materials. Talk about doing some modeling, getting into some SOLIDWORKS models, some FEAs, talking about dimensioning, the size of the parts, which then incorporates along with size and material type, that is your weight and your cost start to come into play right there. Then you get into your parametric design, uh, robust design, set your tolerances from there. And from that, you can get into the detail design there where you really dive into those engineering drawings, CAD models, FEA, and finalizing everything. Something to also think about within this whole design process is how the individual sections of this all interact with each other. It's not necessarily going to be a linear uh, uh, set of events that you're going to follow, things are going to depend upon each other. So we discussed that briefly with a couple of the different topics already. So think about something right here, we talked about the form, you got all these different constraints, configurations, connections, all the different components, uh, and different materials you're going to select for those. Well, the materials are going to affect over here the production. So the production methods, your manufacturing, your assembly, all those are going to be dependent upon the materials and also going to be dependent upon what components actually are. So these are all going to play off each other and we had to make sure that they are all working interactively together and utilizing it. So let's just say we choose a, a stainless steel buckle. So what type of our manufacturing process are we allowed to use for something that needs that level of detail for the buckle there and that small machining processes right there associated with the features of that uh, in a stainless steel. So what things can we utilize for stainless steel for that there? Whereas instead of doing stainless steel, we decided to go with plastic. All of a sudden we have different types of production. We could do some 3D printing, some mold, injection molding, things like that, that we couldn't necessarily do if we were dealing with stainless steel. But again, maybe it's a small teeny little buckle and there's a ton of individual parts within that there. So all of a sudden, yeah, we can might be able to, you know, through the molding for the lever arm of the buckle, but for the stainless steel base of the buckle, then we need to do some uh, type of CNC machining, but then there's springs in there for the assembly process. They're gonna take uh, manual assembly to do and there's not an automated process for that. So we're kind of back and forth between what materials we're selecting, what the components are, what the configurations of those components are, and our production methods. And we wanna make sure that everything functions correctly. So as we continue on with our design project here, something to think about is the customer needs. So this is something that we're going to get at the very beginning, usually, of any of these type of products. Somebody may come to us with what they want, what they need. We need to make sure that we understand very clearly all of their needs and have these written down in an organized manner so that we can determine if we have the capabilities, the knowledge, the skill set to even start this project for them. And if we do have that, we need to make sure that we understand exactly what they want, what their needs are, so that we can meet their needs along the way of this entire design project. So whatever their concepts are, their numbers, anything they have, we need to make sure we have all this information from the customer for what their needs are. So 
Now we need to do the needs identification here. So how can we do this here? Well, there's different methods, how we can gather this information from the customer, the client, whatever it may be, meetings. So we have a lot of face-to-face -face meetings, virtual meetings, whatever it may be, really ask the important questions to make sure we have a clear, concise understanding of what that customer, that client wants from us, what the regulations, specifications need to be for that product. Are there certain weight, cost, uh, functionality, fit, clearances, any of those type of things that are become important. We need to have those all clearly stated. We don't want to find that out once we get down past prototyping and getting ready for production. Like, oh yeah, that's uh, two inches too big. That's not going to work with the other thing. Well, we never specified that in the beginning with the customer needs. We never identified that need at the beginning. That's something we really need to do. So a lot of time needs to be spent in this initial stage of identifying the needs, whether it's your own project, your own product, or for a client. Now for your own one, you got to ask yourself these tough questions. For the client, you really need to make sure you're asking the right questions to get into things that they may take for granted that they haven't communicated with you. Like, well, yeah, this is part of a bigger system. And you may not know that as the designer and the engineer, you might not know what they particularly do. So that's why it's important to do this market research, to do the reviews, to meet with them, to talk with them and ask all of these important questions. From this, you can come up with a needs list within the needs identification. This is important, again, going back to documenting everything. You really want to clearly document everything all along the way because it may be half a year, a year later that you're coming back to certain portions of this project and you want to go back and be able to reference it. So clearly documenting all this needs list is going to be very important. Things to do within this as well, what are needs versus wants? You know, These are specifications that absolutely have to match standards, fit, cloud launches, whatever it is. These are wants. What is the importance value between what the wants are and what the needs are? What can be, you know, compromised, modified, revised, uh, and still make the customer happy, but meet all the absolutely positive requirement needs without sacrificing anything that's going to make uh, the product not function correctly or not meet the needs that the customer wants. So this is something that's also important to do in this needs list here is address all those. Put this into a matrix format, a spreadsheet with all the different like, okay, this is top priority, absolutely needs to be made of stainless steel, but the weight is not quite as important. Or the cost definitely needs to stay under $10,000 for this whole thing, but I'm willing to compromise on something else. So all of these, it's important to be able to reference back in a clear, concise manner of what these needs are and how they kind of fit into a, a grayscale area here for the importance value. So then we'll get into some specification development, talking about different methods associated with this. So things that we need to research a little bit more in this phase here, uh, a little bit more of the prototyping, be it this physical model prototyping, uh, CAD, 3D modeling prototyping, taking a look at different patents. Are you able to get a patent of this? Does one already exist that you need to abide by and not uh, jeopardize any of the limitations of that patent of the person who currently has it? Uh, preliminary concept ideas, uh, all those type of things need to be considered here when we're talking about a little bit more of the specification development here. Now, within these specifications, we need to make sure that these are going to be practical specifications. There's things that we can actually test. Uh, there are numerical values for things, competitive, what the requirements are for these, and everything is clear and concise within all these specifications. So again, this goes back again to, in my opinion, a lot of documentation, a lot of good, clear communication, uh, very good researching. Uh, background information, all of your stuff as far as looking at existing patents, existing products on market, all the stuff becomes important and making sure that we really do clearly and concisely document this the entire process. So now we'll get into another little flow chart here. I think these are great things to think about and ways to organize your thoughts within the design process here. So we'll take a look over here and what we have we can see we start up here with our, our final specifications. So we continue on from that final specifications. What do we do next? We'll review common approaches for the design specifications. Then we ask ourselves this question. Once we've done that review, is there any des obvious design solution? If no, there's not an obvious design solution right there. You know, there's a couple different things we consider that we need to weigh. We did generate design concepts for these unclear specifications so that we can answer yes, there is an obvious design solution. So from that there, once we do this here, either there is an obvious design solution or we just generate design concepts for whatever is unclear in the specifications, we can come back over here and say, okay, yes, we do have an ob obvious design solution. Uh, then we get into research available alternatives. So within that, 
we ask ourselves, are there multiple uh, viable concepts? And if the answer is no, there are not multiple viable concepts, then we come back up here and generate some more design concepts for that. Come back down to this section here until we get to the point that there are multiple viable concepts for this here. We answer yes. And then within these multiple viable concepts, we need to evaluate and rank. So this kind of goes back to what we talked about before, maybe make a little spreadsheet or a matrix here where we can actually evaluate and rank things and look at them clearly and say, okay, yes, this one is better because of this, this, and this. And there may be different, different areas for that evaluation. It might not just be one thing, it might be beneficial in one area and not beneficial in another. And it's great to have that all listed out so that we can compare and rank these. Now the question is, based upon when we evaluate and rank these and we pick one there, is success likeful, likely with any of these? And if the answer is no, back up here, the beginning, where we indicate the problem with the, specify, with the current specifications and change any specifications that we can from that there. If the answer is yes, that success is likely, then we need to select which one is going to be best of the design concepts and go on from there.